all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so we'll continue with our open forum today because i went on a uh, <laughs> a talk about the immune system um, uh, whatever that thing was the paper so let's continue with our uh, discussion of the open forum i would like to continue to go from twitter and then we'll keep going back and forth here as well so uh, once again thank you very much for joining me on zoom yesterday it was so much fun i still remember uh, one of the cool beans comment i think it was margaret who said uh, how does it feel to lose control and it was actually so much fun that everyone was talking and and we we were having our little meeting which we've been missing these kind of things for years now at least for one year so let's start and then we'll continue to have our discussions as well um so hopefully everyone is doing good i'm just going to share my screen and we start um so this is drbean.com and right from the beginning let's get into the discussions so here i'm trying to see if i can share one second please looks like my just for one second <clears throat> yes yes so the uh, i realized afterwards that margaret yesterday was a uh, different margaret she was not margaret mckinnis one second <laughs> just one quick second somehow the twitter is not working for me so i'm just trying to how can how come twitter is not working there it is so <clears throat> back here i'm going to share my screen once more my apologies okay so let's hope we can continue to work so let's start so the question the first one we we went over this one yesterday evox coffee bean no questions thank you so thank you very much you're most welcome evox uh, ellen says your thoughts on the uk variant and what it could mean for children so i have a couple of um, multiple thoughts here first i want to go over what the connecticut children hospital is reporting so here we have this is the connecticut Ch children hospital and according to them they are seeing a higher number of infections in children but they are not seeing those because of the variants so uh, here they have said that these we so far we do not feel that these are from the variants we are still working on the data and uh, we think it is uh, not the variant at the end of the day these are these viruses so one variant or the original some virus is still causing the infections so alan good question and i think that um, the second thought here and this is luffy already the second thought here is from israel so as you may have heard from uh, uh, dr aaron from israel that she said more children are now getting sick as well and she said that we have more uk variant as well so the question is that have they connected that dot that is it the uk variant that is causing the children to become sick or are the children just becoming more sick because virus is more exposed to them as the adults are vaccinated don't know yet but um, this is the report so far ideally what needs to happen is from the children that are getting covid we need to get their swabs from there we need to get the sequencing to understand what is the uh, covid or the strain and then see which strain may be more infectious and more lethal 
Dallas for like question since hypercoagulation is a huge problem but not as much work younger people could be being on prophylaxis aspirin and a statin lower your risk absolutely it would lower the risk but at the same time i would prefer that for youngsters at least don't need to take aspirins and statins as the um, prophylaxis um, or if you do it then please talk with your doctor as well because um, statin have their own some side effects as well that are not very interesting at least for youngsters and secondly the aspirin if you're taking it it would keep your blood thin and uh, for a youngster they don't need that because their blood vessels are actually better their blood is usually working uh, the chemicals in there for the thinning part of it the platelet surfaces the rbc surfaces endothelial surfaces are actually better so yes if there is a risk sure but continuously taking this i would not recommend for youngsters so then uh, there is the robert knight says why does the CDC says ivermectin is not antiviral. So I think the basic um, number one CDC <laughs> has never come out and said something that is interesting. But at the same time, please realize that ivermectin, if we wanted to call it anti some something from a virus point of view, it is more of a viri static. That is, it reduces the further production of the virus, but it does not pick up an existing virus and kill it. So Technically, in medical terms, it is not a viricidal or antiviral. It is a viristatic. From a general uh, mechanism point of view, uh, many articles call this, this uh, behavior as antiviral as well. So CDC may be adhering to a more, uh, I think that they don't even believe that it has any effect. So for them to, or to expect from them that it, they would call it antiviral is actually not that expectation is not right but if we wanted to call it it is very static generally we call it antiviral as well katie says why does the jnj vax only have to be given once when the others are given twice i'm thinking jnj is one to get for that reason so there are so many uh, reasons for some virus, uh, vaccines to be given once or twice uh, generally what happens is this so imagine there are three companies that are making vaccines they all are going to have different parts of the virus that they are targeting, number one. Number two, their adjuvants or their uh, composition of the particles may be different. That's two. Number three, the dose may be different. So based on all of those, they may have been triggering the immune system with varying intensity. So to me, it seems like Moderna and Pfizer, they decided to give the first dose to be on the lower side and then create a booster after three, four weeks when the immune system has become primed. On the other hand, considering that JNJ says one dose is sufficient, their one dose should have enough quantity in it that it primes, that is trains the immune system and then boosts it as well within the same dose. And that is a similar thing that we are seeing with Pfizer as well. Although over three months of time we are seeing Pfizer vaccine continues to, at least that is what they're claiming, and that is what we can uh, work with, uh, that it continues to increase the immune system's potency as the days go by. And that is understandable. Uh, what happens is that the immune system cells, they would continue to proliferate, that means increase in number, and then they would continue to become more uh, fine as well. Their maturity would continue to increase as well. So as the days go by, the immunity should actually improve. So that may be the reason here, the, the, dose, the dosage, the composition of the vaccine, and then just the way it triggers the immune system. Um, Janet says, how are you feeling, Dr. Bean? Want you to be well. So I am doing very well, Janet. Nowadays, I just have these allergies. So I am taking uh, uh, Flonase and I'm taking Allegra, but I'm not taking anything else other than the supplements and all good. So you may feel little congestion in my sound, and that is uh, uh, this uh, allergies. So Janet, thank you very much for your concern. Thank you for asking. Carlos Ortiz says, can you please comment if there would be any issue with taking ivermectin along with cetraline? And what I had done was for this one, and Carlos, I have a link in the description as well. And what I did was if you go to drug, drugs.com, you can actually 
you can just Google drug inter interaction and you would come up with many uh, sites. So if you go in here and for, and for example, here, if you say ivermectin and then let's say sertraline. And then check for interactions. No interactions were found. So this is uh, this is a place to go and see drug and food interactions. So there are some interactions for sertraline with the food. Therapeutic duplication warning: Is it going to increase the potency? So if you wanted to see more, you can go to such sites and see it, so that uh, you're comfortable and you can actually see interaction with other drugs as well. Pam says. Also, would like to ask, since my husband has been on oxygen and I am using long haul protocols, do you know anything dietary to repair alveoli and prevent fibrosis? So Pam, this is something that I have very less um, knowledge of for dietary material that may be able to help with the uh, fibrosis and um, alveolar repair. Any cool bean here who, who may know that any dietary any food items that may be able to help. Um, why not we answer some, <laughs> do some discussion here as well. So let's see what's happening here. Yes, Jody, allergy season is starting. And so <laughs> you can actually hear that in my voice. Um, Alpha says, can we see Luffy? Yes. So if you give me a minute, I'm going to go find Luffy. Do you want me to go find Luffy right, right now? So give me one minute. I'm going to see, go see where, where he is. Okay, so here we have Luffy. Hey, Luffy. <laughs> Do you wanna? He's totally not happy. Okay, cool. <laughs> so here was the little Luffy. Let's continue. Um, I'm going to share my screen, continue going over the questions as well. Luffy is a little quiet today. He was actually sleeping. Poor thing. He's going to blame me now for waking him up. <laughs> there he is. OK. Hey, Luffy. Luffy. OK, so Renal Sherry says, is RDRP the protein building block that a virus uses to scaffold out pieces for their clones. So yes, we have done this discussion slightly in the past as well. What happens is that when the virus enters our cell, so let's say this is the cell, and the coronavirus wants to enter in, in our cell, there are two routes for it to enter. One is that it can actually just bind with this, and then the membrane of the virus, the envelope as we call it, that gets fused with our membrane, and the RNA is in our cell. Or the whole virus and the receptor, they can become internalized as endocytosis or phagocytosis. That means we eat it up, and it becomes a 
um, vacuum. It becomes a small pocket in which the virus is present. Then the acidification in the system changes and the virus is freed from here. And then the RNA is liberated. This RNA then binds with our ribosome. So this is our cute little ribosome. Ribosome is going to make polyproteins of the virus from here. These polyproteins have one, two important proteins. One is the RDRP, and the other one is three chymotrypsin-like protein. Both of these proteins break off from here, and then they start helping to produce more viruses, or the replication process is started by them. So yes, that is a necessary protein for making further pieces of the virus in general. Yes, Luffy is a Bengal. I just saw Simple Garden says Bengal. Yes, Luffy is a Bengal. Kairi is a Bengal too. Priya says, just watching the replay from last night, it's sadly too late at night for me to be there live, but it was me who sent the link above. You mentioned at 4.15. I look forward to your discussion. Cool. Thank you, Priya. Um, <clears throat> Sick of Rupert <laughs> says, please read this and address in the next COVID session. So I think this was about the hormone replacement therapy. We'll talk more separately as well. I did not see that what mechanism was actually helping, but the paper says that hormone replacement therapy in women reduces the all-cause mortality, mortality during uh, COVID. So that is an interesting observation. Um, Romo 3. Rome 3.0, I have to I have to study this drugs mechanism with COVID. So for the time being, I'm going to pass on this one. I have taken a note. Uh, Pezzo says, still optimistic about ivermectin going widespread soon. What needs to happen so authorities can't postpone it more? So uh, can ivermectin go wide, widespread? I think that the other interests are much more prevalent and much more influential. I don't see ivermectin going prevalent at the, at least in the developed countries or um, with the with more red tape. However, I feel that those countries where the healthcare system is slightly more flexible, they will catch on and they will use it. Many countries have been using it, and it would continue to be that way. What needs to happen so authorities can't postpone it more? Um, it is the studies. They respond to studies. I think there are decent studies. And I think the second part is, if you compare ivermectin with other drugs, how do others other drugs are getting approved? They are by big pharma who may have direct, who probably have um, a chance to just pick up a call, a phone and make a call to FDA or CDC or somebody in there and say, hey, have you seen this or not? Uh, there is nobody who's doing this for ivermectin other than folks like um, Dr. Pierre Corey, Dr. Merrick, myself and some other doctors, but they are not able to call into CDC and say, we are asking you to do it. We are just make, raising our voice in these platforms. So that is the basic problem. Simone says they've just banned ivermectin kit in city on the south of Brazil today, saying it is not FDA approved for COVID. So that's just sad. Uh, Damien, so one couple of more things here, and then I'll come to the uh, live side. Damien Hansi says, I've heard taking ibuprofen or acetaminophen for discomfort after the second wave, wave dose of COVID vaccine, either Moderna or Pfizer, may reduce the vaccine's efficacy and it's better to just grin and bear it. Any evidence science behind this? So yes, let's talk about that. And I'm going to give you a few uh, varying notes as well. And I'll explain the mechanism as well. And then we can form an opinion. So first of all, here, this is CDC. Again, we trust them. We don't trust them. But in their pamphlet, they, says, they say, do you see here ibuprofen or acetaminophen? So they're saying, if you have pain or discomfort after getting your vaccine, talk to your doctor about taking an over-the-counter medicine such as ibuprofen or acetaminophen. That is one. Second, here, similar thing, if you see here as well, 
this is also CDC, and they say, talk to your doctor about taking over-the-counter medicines such as ibuprofen, estaminophen, aspirin, or antihistamines for any pain and discomfort you may experience after getting vaccinated. You can take these medications to relieve post-vaccination side effects if you have no other medical reasons that prevent you from taking these medicines normally. So this is what they're saying. Let's look at the mechanism a little bit. So <clears throat> I had actually taken some notes here that we wanted to talk about it Italy today, then the Czech Republic and the cases increasing there. One of the cool beans had put that co comment out, ivermectin dose interaction and those that we're doing, and then painkillers and the vaccines. So um, generally what happens is any inflammation. So let's just say this virus has arrived in the cell and the cell has now presented pieces of virus on its surface to the immune system. So let's say this is a naive T cell and then we know the remaining system. At the same time, when the virus is presenting the vaccine pieces, it is also going to be looked at by the dendritic cells and the macrophages. So let's say this is a dendritic cell or a macrophage, right? So these cells, when they become active as well, they would release. So these cells that are now going to become active because there is a vaccine in there or there is an infection in there, uh, either way, they're going to release multiple cytokines. But interestingly, IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha are important for inflammation. So remember that there are two parts of the response. One is the... Um, immune part of the response and the other one is inflammation part of the response although they both are together they are intertwined and they amplify each other as well but inflammation part is something that causes redness in the area of the injury or infection and then it causes swelling in that area and then it causes generalized fever and immune system activation as well. So let's now look at what kind of immune system activation is there due to inflammation that may be blunted by ibuprofen or acetaminophens or aspirins or other things. So let's see this. As long as the these drugs are con considered the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, they do not have much action on this directly. So the vaccine's effect on the immune system where innate arm is working and then innate arm is causing the adaptive arm to start working as well. That part, um, ibuprofen, aspirins would not do much with that. However, as the interleukins are released, these would cause, for example, interleukin 1 is going to go and cause fever. Interleukin 6 would work on liver and then cause acute phase proteins, acute phase proteins to be released from liver, which, so these proteins, for example, C-reactive protein and ferritin and so many, celluloplasmine and hep hepcidin and so on, these proteins in turn will cause the chemotaxis. Chemotaxis mean uh, pulling of the immune system cells, right? Attracting something. Chemotaxis of the immune system cells to come here which includes neutrophils, which are immune cells, which includes other WBCs. It in includes a natural killer cells, T cells, B cells, and so on. More macrophages, mo monocytes. So these cells will be called in this area by some of these acute phase proteins. And then tumor necrosis factor alpha has also similar uh, white cell activation and chemotaxis like behavior. These all mostly are because of the inflammatory side. And if we take medicines like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, some of these cytokines quantity will be reduced. And of course, that result is that prostaglandin and leukotrienes, they will be reduced. And that would reduce the swelling and pain and, and the feeling of uh, fever and, and tiredness. But at the same time, there is a possibility of slight reduction in immune response, immune response that can blunt some of the effect of the vaccine. Now, how much is a debate? 
nobody actually knows that will taking ibuprofen actually just wash out the vaccine's effect. I don't think that is the case. And uh, or would it just be 1% reduction? So there is no measurement done so far. So if I show you other um, messages, for example, uh, I have some other links here as well, which show that there is a possibility of blunting, but there is not much, um, I think, over here. All right, so this is the link. In here, there is a... So, sorry, I cannot find it here, but on this page, there is a link that says that, hey, if you can avoid taking the uh, ibuprofen or aspirin, do that. But if you take it, it's not too much of a worry. So with this, my opinion is that taking this will not actually cause so much blunting of the immune system that the vaccine's effect is gone. Okay, so with this, let me come here on this side. How is everyone doing here? Um, <laughs> Shardivar says, why are you not vaccinated? You're getting less credible. So uh, Shardivar, I have not been called yet for vaccination. So until I'm called, I will not get vaccination. So that is just that. And I am getting less credible or more credible. I, I don't care. I do these talks on a daily basis, and I would continue to do them. You don't like them, you can take your bags and go. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this is how, if the credibility is for you, then uh, you can figure out what is the best for you. OK, continuing. Um, Uh, Arubaga, Arubaga, I saw that you said uh, you were trying to see for the Avermectin. So I hope that you are here in California. So with good RX, the Avermectin can be can be seen for let uh, $26 or so. So please text me if you like. What's happening? What's going on with Jenna? So Jenna, please do me a favor. Do some massage here as well. The ear pain, is this, uh, do you have swelling or the feeling of swelling here as well, right ear or, so please do some massage, neck massage here and um, see why is that pain? Do you also have pain here in your throat area too? Texas Meg. So uh, Texas Meg, are you the Margaret yesterday on the call? My fear of having angry mass cells already stirred up, swollen eyes ach aching, causing trouble pre-vaccine makes me want to wait for vaccine when hyperinflamed. Hmm. So logic says that what is causing Guillain-Barre post-vaccine? So this is a very important question that what is the reason for the side effects, some of these side effects? For example, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, or the, the bleeding, or the clotting, or the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or some other neurological effects. So there are two ways that the effects are going to appear. So let me draw them. And this is not just the vaccine. Any immune system response can cause this. Normally, our body has mechanisms to control these things. But in some some folks, just like allergies, these things can cause more reaction. Just like COVID can cause cytokine storm, similarly, some vaccines can 
cause overreaction in some folks. So there are two ways that the vaccines can do this. So let's say here is a cell, normal cell, and here is a vaccine. Vaccine entered the cell. Let's say this is a lipid nanoparticle. Then we made the spike protein. Eventually, we presented the spike protein. That then caused the activation of the immune system. So we, we know this part, correct? This activation caused the cytokines to be released. So while the immune system is now preparing and learning and understanding this vaccine and the spike protein, immune system out of its own habit and mechanism is releasing cytokines as well. These cytokines in turn will cause production of inflammation and inflammatory system like prostaglandins and leukotrienes and other cytokines. So this is immediate response, inflammatory response. Then when the antibodies start producing, so let's say this is the B cell, the B cell becomes a plasma cell. That plasma cell is now producing antibodies and these antibodies are going to be circulating in the body. Now, what happens is that antibodies, and this would happen with any infection as well, the actual COVID infection can do it, the vaccines can do it, any other infection with some other virus, common cold, these things can do it. So it's not necessary that this mechanism that you're going to hear would happen in everyone. But this is the basis of the some of the severe reactions. One more thing here, that immediate allergic reaction is because of the components of the vaccine itself. So vaccine components, for example, let's say that uh, glycol or the, the aluminum or some other component in the vaccine, these can cause allergies. So that's a very different uh, mechanism and different pathway. So allergies can occur. Then because of cytokines, there can be pain, swelling, side effects that we can see. And then those severe side effects is when these antibodies are produced. Antibodies now need to be circulating in the in our blood and serum. Usually after spending three, four weeks, normally two to three weeks after living in our body for two to three weeks, then these antibodies are cleared out. They are broken down. They are picked up by macrophages. They are broken down, digested and broken up. This is like you take an old house and just break it down into smaller pieces and remove that garbage. So that is what happens to the antibodies that are present. But meanwhile, antibodies can end up binding onto our cell surfaces. Now, let's say this is a neuron which whose surface on the surface is an antibody sitting. When the antibody sits on a cell's surface, then it causes complement activation. Complement activation is a normal biological mechanism that allows the complement proteins to become activated and they try to damage the surface on which the antibody is sitting, thinking that this is a pathogen. Now imagine this is not a pathogen, this is the myelin sheath of our neuron, an antibody is sitting on this. Now we are going to cause damage to our neurons and that is going to cause some sort of a neurological outcome. So this is how uh, antibody, and there are more mechanisms. For example, there could be um, macrophage that comes in here and the antibody binds with the macrophage. In turn, macrophage can release uh, various cytokines as well. Natural killer cells can become activated and so on. So there are many ways that antibodies can activate various systems and those can cause damage to various cells. Usually that kind of a damage is controlled we we can handle it and we handle it all the time we have antibodies right now circulating in our systems all of us if we didn't have it we would die very soon so our body is working and antibodies are clearing out and being produced but in some people there can be a reaction or overreaction to these So Jenna says, day four antibiotics, right? Ear pain, awful. Jenna, have you taken any painkillers? Uh, I just saw one more question from Logic. Dr. Bean Medical Lectures, anything we can do to prevent that in patients who had this before? Yes. So of course, this is something which has to be spoken with your doctor very clearly that taking, let's say, some vaccine caused the GBS. So that means I would not recommend taking 
vaccine in such a patient. But let's say the, the vaccine taking is necessary, the patient needs it, and the cost benefit analysis makes makes it so that the vaccine has to be taken, then uh, ibuprofen, uh, aspirins, plus some steroids, uh, antihistamines. So all those things that can prevent the activation of the immune system to an extra amount can be given to blunt it down. And that can help. Again, some autoimmune diseases, we use steroids that only temporarily blunt it. But then it, if you stop the steroid, it comes back. So I think when you give the vaccine, uh, when you give steroids with the vaccine, it has to continue for some time so that the vaccine doesn't cause damage. But then at the same time, if you suppress the immune system, then you're opening up the patient for infections as well, inclu including COVID. This is why this is something that has to be done with a doctor's advice and oversight. <laughs> so, uh, so lying guys, you have been leaving some uh, comments here, which uh, show that you are upset. Neither did I label him as anti-vaxxer. I actually go and read it again. I said in my talk that the doctor asked him that, are you an anti-vaxxer? And he said, it doesn't matter if I am anti-vaxxer or vaxxer. It is irrelevant. And I said that was an underhanded way of being anti-vaxxer. He should have been simply saying, I am not an anti-vaxxer, but I am against the vaccine at this time. That would have been a better answer, number one. Number two, if anybody else commented that, hey, we don't care for the anti-vaxxers, then, then that is a comment. So if you do not know how to listen correctly, then I am not sitting here bound to respond to you, and I'm not blocking you because I respect you, you've been with us for some time. But just don't make up things. You, you told me that I didn't like people calling me names and I am calling him names. I didn't call him any names. I actually still cannot remember how to pronounce his name. So that's just my problem. So today I was trying to see, OK, how can I abbreviate his name and use it? So that is how it is. So uh, at the end of the day, you are entitled to your commentary. And I am entitled to let people go as well. Um, LF says, I have a blood clotting disorder, 83 deficiency. Why are some saying that this may be a concern with vaccination? So vaccination, so let me explain that part as well. So I explained just now how a vaccine may cause, let's say, neurological symptoms. Let's see how a vaccine may cause blood thinning or clotting either way. For example, idiop idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura is a blood thinning problem. On the other hand, just like now some European countries are saying that for AstraZeneca, let's in abundance of caution, let's reduce the or stop or pause because this may be clotting by, by the vaccine or may not be, although they are saying the number of cases in vaccinated and non-vaccinated are the same. Still, they wanted to investigate. So let's see how this can happen. So let's say here is a red blood cell. This is another red blood cell. Now, let's say we have given somebody a vaccine. That vaccine ended up creating antibodies. And we know that the antibodies will not be generated right away. They would take some time. Or maybe the second dose, after the second dose, there will be more. But antibodies are eventually going to be produced. Let me back up. For the SARS-CoV-2, it is actually possible that in some people, antibody quantity is really low. And it is a cytotoxic T cell that would work more. But I am talking in general, majority of the people would produce antibodies. Those antibodies can actually settle on RBCs as well. 
And if they do settle there, or they can settle on platelets, or they can settle on the endothelial surfaces. And if they settle there, then it is possible that they would start binding platelets together or endothelium and the RBC or endothelium and the platelet that in turn then start a cascade of the um, coagulation. And that may be some clotting that may happen. Again, this is a theoretical possibility. And this is what they have to investigate now for AstraZeneca to see it. So when somebody asks you to be careful, this is the reason. But ideally, what should happen is you talk with your doctor. They should know your history, that what is the clotting disorder? How have they been managing it? And then on top of that, if they take the vaccine, if you take the vaccine, what is the theoretical possibility? And what preparation should they have if that clotting occurs? Vaccine and not we both stay infectious. So no sense to blame. And the vaccine is a person choice. It gives a person a smile. Absolutely. And I have never tried to um, badmouth anyone vaccine or not vaccine. I have actually specifically tried to never speak against anti-vaxxers. So that there are things like ivermectins and vitamin Ds and many others. So maybe there is something that is useful for everyone. So, um, but I also understand uh, with this Dr. Geert, what I find interesting, so I received some tw tweets as well, and I found out that what happened was he was used by some of the folks as a scientific evidence for why vaccination should not be done. And this is out of real concern. People are nervous about the vaccines. There are some people who are anti-vaxxers. And then there are people who are not anti-vaxxers, but still nervous. For example, Dr. Pierre Corey, he said, I'm not anti-vaxxer, but I'm afraid of vaccine. So if I can go on without vaccine, I will. So he said it. And they found a poster boy to prop up and say, here is a doctor who can prove to you scientifically that vaccines are bad. So I was seeing on Twitter that when somebody would say that he is incorrect, people would respond to that person and say, bring in some science, talk with science. Why don't you show us what science do you have to prove that he is wrong? And when I brought in some science just for a couple of sentences, the people became mad. And there, there were so many comments that I am incompetent and I do not know the science and I do not know biology and people wanted to teach me what selection pressure is and all that. Anyways, at the end of the day, the science has to be correct. If his science immune, immune system is not different for, for him versus me or somebody else, neither does the immune system become different for somebody who has worked for 40 years in it or somebody who's worked for 25 years in it. So science is science. So I cannot work with the religious part of it where people just want to prop up someone. Anyways, let's not waste time on that. Let's continue. So line guys, once again, I said to the cool beans that we can go over his discussion. He said vaccines are bad or he didn't say vaccines are bad. I know he kept saying in his interview, vaccines are awesome. And I really like the, the researchers who have made them and great work. And then he said, don't don't use them. So I do not know where are my statements incorrect. I just am saying that he does not want the vaccines. He wants the vaccination to stop. So if that is the incorrect statement, then so be it. William Goff, Dr. Bean, I got first Moderna shot, but believe I won't be getting the second. We are chest pains, I believe, are gas pains. How necessary is shot too? So um, the, the problem is this. 
if I if I provide you my opinion, this is just an opinion. This is not an advice. It is possible that just like Pfizer, or just like Johnson and jo Johnson, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, sorry, AstraZeneca like vaccines, and Moderna may in a few weeks, maybe not in two weeks or three weeks, maybe in six weeks or eight weeks, they would become, um, they would have created enough of an immune response that it would be efficacious. The only thing is it is not tested well. So for me or for anyone else to be able to say his second dose may not be needed. In theory, it is possible if the dose, the first dose was sufficient and it caused the immune system to have enough proliferation of the cells and enough preparation of the cells that when the actual virus arrives, immune system can respond, then the first dose is fine as well. The question is how long? For example, AstraZeneca came back. Was it AstraZeneca or it was Pfizer, I believe, in UK? They came back and they said, yeah, up till 90 days, it keeps building up immunity. We don't know about Moderna in that way. So, for example, I cannot say to you that if you take the vaccine today, how long, four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks or three months after you are fully protected? That is the data not known. And the second part not known is, is it really necessary to have the booster dose to trigger the immune system once more? Or can the first dose actually bring you to enough effectiveness that is reasonable? These two things are not known because these are not tested. Absolutely, Jenna. You can be against experimental vaccines and not. You can be against any, any vaccine and still not be anti-vaxxer. I don't have a problem with that. OK, so let's continue. So um, Sheikh Maniac says, are you going to go over the learn about clinical trials? The exact sense there are a lot of people saying the trial failed, yet six endpoints were statistically relevant. So I had um, um, Cytodyne CEO with me. I am not yet impressed with the Lironle Maps data. Even that talk did not impress me that much. So I'm going to stay back from Lironle Map till there is some more data which is clear and valuable to discuss. Yes, Denise, you are correct. So Denise is mostly concerned about his chest pain after Moderna. Yes, and that that is something that should be reported back as well and should be worked up with your doctor because it's not necessary to guess. So Jim, uh, Dr. Bean had COVID. Jim, um, I'm going to get my IgM and IgG done. If I had COVID and I have antibodies, I don't need vaccine after that. So you are correct. Then then why do I need vaccine? But if I, let's say, didn't have COVID, I don't have IgMs and IgGs, then I'm still in line to get my vaccine. Jim says, lost sound. Can you Can you hear me? <laughs> Jana says, I have antibodies, no vaccine. Correct. Uh, so Thrill0415 says, blood types A and B clot better. Type O have less clotting factor. I'll be taking vitamin K500, vitamin K2 or K1, 500 milligram before and after J&J, but for how long afterwards? afterwards? That is, once again, the right way to see that is to actually get your blood um, you know, the bleeding uh, labs done. So bleeding time labs done. So that is something, once again, uh, speak with your doctor and do it with doctor's oversight. Barbara says, that's funny. And yes, it didn't impress many of us too much, to be honest. We are spoiled listening to your excellent lectures. Thank you, Barbara. I was not, and I was, uh, I felt a little bit that I, um, 
presented a talk that didn't really have much substance in it. And uh, I love Leroy Lima from a mechanism point of view. I just need to have data that is good to be able to discuss that. William says, I, I will be honest, I do believe my chest pains and gas pains because my stomach has been bubbling my intestine. I'm assuming this guy was still, it's weird. Yeah, so um, William, I would still suggest talk with your doctor so that you can think about the second dose. If, let's say if it was gas and you're still thinking of skipping the second dose, then there is a risk that is being produced. So talk with the doctor. Emily, you are absolutely correct. Okay, so let's see one. <laughs> Jim Maddox says, I have blood. Oh, I can donate if someone wants it. Um, I'm going to go to. <laughs> Stephen says, Dr. Sayed, I've taken organic chemistry at a junior college. Can I give you a tutorial on immunology? Absolutely, whenever you like. Okay, so um, I'm going to. So Nina says, is there a chance I could have MS relapse on the j, &J vaccine activating my immune system? So Nina, that is something that for all vaccines, we have to be careful uh, to see that can they cause exacerbation of any of the autoimmune disease. So we just have to look into their, uh, so they have, at least in the US, all vaccines that are approved, FDA releases a document about their efficacy and side effects and all that. So we just have to look through that. Okay, so <clears throat> continuing on. Fishtail, thank you very much. And there was another um, super chat before. Thank you very much. Denise, thank you very much as well. So thank you for all the super chats. Um, okay, so let's do this. I'm going to answer some more questions on the... Um, here is a question. So Monk USSY says, I got influenza vaccine in between Pfizer shot. Was told I shouldn't have done that. Any reason why? So actually, no reason. Here is what they decided. Originally, what they wanted to do was, let's say you've taken a vaccine, let's say COVID. And there was even a discussion of lumping those vaccines together. The problem is, as Nina just said, uh, sorry, Jenna just said a few minutes ago, these are still experimental vaccines, so these are new vaccines. And so the side effects of a vaccine are still not fully clear. So what they do is they say, please don't take the vaccines together so we can be able to attribute the side effect to one or the other. And so they are giving a specific time to say at least two to three weeks apart, keep them. So that if there is a side effect, we can say, well, this was the flu vaccine that did it, or this was a COVID vaccine that did it. That was the basic problem. There is no other reason these vaccines cannot neutralize or cross-react with each other in a negative way. This was the basic reason that they wanted it. So what I do not know is that how, what was the gap between them, but the, the logic is this. So Colin says, tried for an entire week, Dr. Bean. You were right. They just ran me around in circles when I tried to get in contact with the chief of medical officer to get a reason why they won't allow him in North Ireland. The thing is this, that if you just think about it, um, um, now I'm going to say something once again that people would put comments. But just like, let's say, Dr. Geert, he's saying um, stop vaccines. And he has a specific position. Um, and he wants people to listen to him. 
look at Fauci. He has a specific position as well, and he's not going to budge from there either. And everyone who is in some um, leadership position, they have formed a corner. They're not going to budge from that corner. If Fauci mm -hmm. cannot be changed, although, look, ivermectin is such an important thing, I suspect it's similar everywhere. And it's unfortunate. Okay, so So Lion Guys is saying, thank the crew here. Great when the open forum will allow for ideas to be exchanged. Uh, totally fine, Lion Guy. And I'm, I'm looking at your comment here that you're going to ban yourself. Uh, my reason is very simple. If you are just going to start saying that I'm lying here or I am somehow not able to understand the com commentary or it is disgusting, so then uh, totally up to you. Don't be here if you feel it that way. But... If you wanted to exchange the ideas, I presented some ideas as well. I did not say that Dr. Geert's ideas were disgusting. I simply said that he was not correct. So you can say I am not correct and we can continue with our discussion. But if you are just going to keep saying you are incorrect, you're lying and, and you're not going to put some evidence in front, then I, I can't help that. OK, so let's continue. Um, absolutely. Um, let's see. You can recent I've worked in this. Uh, many scientists only had one goal which is to defeat virus but never consider effects of lockdowns and kids business yep William says I'm 75 got my second written a shot today congratulations William and saving my avermectin in case I'm in the unlucky hopefully you would be fine but yes, ivermectin should be kept. All right, so let me answer some more of the <laughs> Twitter questions as well. Twitter folks would become upset with me. OK, so continuing on here, uh, Jessica, question. If someone takes first dose of ivermectin prophylaxis but forgets to take second dose 48 hours later, what should they do? The second dose when realized or go on to taking the weekly fortnightly doses. I would still take the second dose. So let's say two days. There have been studies that use the second dose on third day. There have been studies that have used second dose on fifth day. So if you can take the second dose, fine. But if since your question till now enough time is spent, then you can just shift to the um, biweekly prophylaxis. And once again, <laughs> not a directed advice or prescription for you. Just in general, this is how prophylaxis can be done in theory. Janet says, who will prescribe ivermectin to me? I think then Janet responded again and uh, had a, a, a link here as well. And Janet, if you look at my videos, a few days ago, I did a video doctors who are prescribing ivermectin and how to get ivermectin for lesser. So I have their flccc.net. If you go there, they also have a list. Scarlett says, if I have been taking ivermectin as a prophylaxis, 12 milligram once a week, can I have a COVID-19 vaccine or will it make the vaccine inert, kill the vaccine? No. So Scarlett, we have done this discussion before as well. The uh, ivermectin's job is to work with the virus. And if I just quickly remind us, this is what happens. So which cool bean knows this one? I think this has been repeated many times. So let's say when the virus arrives, one potential mechanism 
of ivermectin is to sit between the spike protein and the ACE2 and kind of disrupt their binding. So that can reduce the virus's entry into the cell. Now, the vaccine, when that arrives, so let's say here we have a lipid nanoparticle, this like Moderna or Pfizer. Lipid nanoparticle would just enter the cell without having to bind with the ACE2. So will ivermectin hinder here? No. Will ivermectin hinder here with the virus? Yes. With the vaccine? No. Then once the virus is in our cell, virus is going to eject its messenger RNA. That will then go and attach with our ribosome. And the ribosomes will then start making RDRP and three chymotrypsin-like protease and the other big polyprotein. These are actually part of that big polyprotein as well. But anyways, make proteins for the virus that would help the virus start dividing. And ivermectin potentially disrupts these two as well. Now, when the vaccine arrives and there is an RNA in there, that RNA does not produce the RDRP or 3 chymotrypsin like enzymes. That RNA simply produces spike proteins. And these spike proteins are then shredded and presented on the surface. So does ivermectin do anything here? No, not at all. So will ivermectin disrupt a vaccine? No. Now then, once the, vac the virus here, the third thing, once the virus is working and it is sending its cargo to the nucleus using a protein alpha and beta to tell the nucleus that, hey, don't secrete interferon alpha. Don't defend yourself. And ivermectin can potentially disrupt that as well. Now, vaccine does not do that. Vaccine does not make an enzyme that needs to go into the nucleus and stop the nucleus from defending itself. So because of that, ivermectin will do nothing. And finally, so this means in all of these steps, ivermectin does not interfere with the vaccine and it does interfere with the, uh, with the virus. Then um, if you go for a normal inflammatory response, then what happens is that for the inflammatory responses, there is nuclear factor kappa B. That is a pathway of the inflammation and ivermectin and both vaccine and the virus will result in activating this pathway. This is a pathway which is one part of the pathway to cause pain, swelling, and um, uh, what is that? The pain, swelling, and fever. So the nuclear factor kappa B is somewhat tempered down, blocked by ivermectin. So ivermectin can reduce the inflammatory outcome of the vaccine a tiny bit, but, and the same with the virus as well. So not much interference at all. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, continuing on. So Scarlett, I hope that answers that question. Julia says, I know this discussion is past, but I've been thinking about this for a while. Some scientists said, Coronaviruses have been with us for a long time and may be related with the common cold. If that is so, could ivermectin be the long sought after remedy? So, Julia, very good question. So, we do have coronaviruses. They, these are human coronaviruses. And um, every year, 15 to 30 percent of the common cold that we experience, 15 to 30 percent of the people's common cold is actually by human coronaviruses. So yes, for them, ivermectin can actually help. But for the remaining common cold, for example, with the rhinovirus or with the other viruses, the ivermectin may not be useful. Good question, though. OK, how are we doing here? That's a very interesting question. Jim says, does the UK allow vitamin D? So do they have fortified vitamin D? I do not know. Jimmy saying, lol, Trevor in France, next Zoom stand-up comedy starring you in France. But seriously, I often listen to replay in my ear and I fall asleep to it. Hopefully, the more difficult concepts get into my brain. <laughs> Jamie, that is funny. Um,
Yeah, ivermectin is something that is. Uh, Rubies says, I'm so confused. Rubies, what happened? Ronald says, which is better, given I've, everyone I've met in or given, give everyone a vaccine? So I talked about this, I believe, in December. And I used the word bridge. I believe, and I may be wrong, but I still believe, ivermectin should become worldwide available. And till the people are vaccinated, we should provide this bridge of safety. The reason I say this, for example, there are many people who say, you know what, just skip vaccine and keep taking ivermectin. The only thing that I have for, the, for that is that we do not know for long-term usage of ivermectin that what would happen if we keep taking it every week. That's the only part not known. Of course, now many people have started taking it. We'll know how it works, but that is the one unknown. So if somebody wanted to take it, in theory, it is possible that they don't need to go for a vaccine. But um, what are the chances that ivermectin might fail in them? And what are the chances that there may be side effects? So that is the uh, question. So in my opinion, ivermectin should be given until vaccination happens. Again, not an advice to anyone, just me talking uh, educational material. Art Ninjiok says, question, is one somewhat safe from the variants if one had Moderna Vax and or original virus? Very, very interesting question. Nobody had actually asked me this question, that if somebody has the original virus versus Moderna, what is the safety? I think the answer is similar in both cases. Because if I got original virus, my body has learned to attack that virus in a specific way. Let me actually, uh, while talking about it, I felt that original virus infection may actually be better. So let me explain. So first disclaimer, getting infected by the original virus has a very real chance of death as well. So original virus infection is not advised. So I won't say here that, hey, just go get infected. In theory, when, let's say, this is our cell, and the virus has arrived in the cell. So this was the virus, original virus. Now, when the virus arrives, it is broken up into smaller pieces. We've been talking about it for a long time. And those smaller pieces would be pieces of its RNA, pieces of its spike proteins, pieces of its N proteins, pieces of its M protein, pieces of its envelope. So all of the virus, the whole virus's dead body is broken up into smaller pieces and then presented on the cell surfaces. And so then the immune system responds to that. So immune system does not only respond to the, let's say, the, the spike protein area, it responds to the other proteins as well. So when the variant arrives, variant may have only a change in the spike protein, but the remaining part is still similar. So our body would still be able to mount a good response. On the other hand, in the case of spike protein, although today I was, some, uh, I was doing some research about the variant in the spike protein and the vaccine. So when the vaccine arrives, it creates a specific model of the spike protein. This is like a car, 1980s car versus 2000s car. So the spike protein RNA that is present in the vaccine may be for the original virus. So that is the spike protein made and shredded and shown. And that is to what our immune system responds and learns to behave. Then the actual virus arises, which is a variant, and that may have a small dent in the spike protein, which is different. So here is a dent. And now if, if there was an antibody that was binding in this area, in this area, and that area has been changed, then that one antibody will fail for, from the vaccine. But I have done this discussion as well, that there are about 200 epitopes here. So if one 
uh, antibody fails, it does not matter a lot. Just like if one antibody fails here, it does not matter a lot as well because body can still mount response to the remaining parts of the virus. Sim similarly, we can mount a response to the remaining part of the, the uh, spike protein. Still, if the spike protein continues to be changed, in the case of vaccine, we are only showing a smaller part of the virus. And here we are showing a larger part of the virus. So actual infection from a protection point of view is better than the vaccine. However, actual infection does have a higher risk as well. So, so Ruby Zaret says, Dr. Bean, I'm unsure if I agree that would infection, wild infection is better than vaccine. I don't think the issue is variety of epitos with the live virus. I think it's about the individual immunity, poor affinity. Um, so let's talk about that. I would not contradict you, but let's think about it for a second. Um, let's talk about affinity. And this is something that um, I saw with the um, Dr. Geert's message as well. <clears throat> the concept I'm going to write here is affinity maturation. And anyone who wants to teach me immunology can look up this one as well so that we both are on the same page. Uh, what happens is, Rubies, that let's say this is a cell and the virus arrives in it. So I've bypassed all the binding and everything. The virus is in the cell. And when the virus is in the cell and it is broken up by our um, phagocytes and phagolysosomes and endosomes, and it's broken down into smaller pieces, and then those pieces are shown outside, correct? Then there are neutrophils as well. And once again, all of this, what I'm saying, is totally um, seeable in the books. Neutrophils as well, they are picking up these viruses too, and they are breaking them apart as well. Usually what neutrophil do, do is, when they break these uh, antigens apart, they usually do not present them. Neutrophils are not known as antigen presenting cells like other professional antigen presenting cells. So what neutrophil do is very irresponsibly, they throw some of these pieces out in the tissue. From those tissue, the lymph flow will take these pieces all the way to the lymph nodes. And inside the lymph nodes, we have B cells and we have T cells. And we have things called follicular dendritic cell, follicular dendritic cells. These are special dendritic cells that are resident of the lymph nodes. They don't go out. They just sit in there. Their job is to pick up these pieces that these irresponsible cells had thrown out. This is like trash thrown out on the road, which is then washed away with the rainwater. So which was thrown out, these are going to pick them up and present them to the plasma cells, memory cells. These are the memory cells that are the cells for this specific antigen. Every time they present it, the B cells binding maturity occurs, which is called affinity maturation. So the more, so, so let me now back up from a uh, advancer stage. And that is, imagine a person got the infection and then they recovered. When they recovered, that is an indication that their immune system was able to take care of the virus. Now, from the recovery, if we back up, what had happened was during this time, Innatum attacked the virus, made these all antigens, presented them to the adaptive arm, threw them in the lymphatics that went into the lymph nodes. Over there, affinity maturation occurred. When affinity maturation occurs, the binding becomes tighter, plus the cells proliferate. With the actual infection, the number of new viruses that are being produced and being chopped up and being destroyed and then being brought to the lymph nodes is much, much greater than what a vaccine can do. 
a vaccine does not have the capability of continuing to continue to produce the spike proteins over, let's say, 14 days or 20 days or seven days. Number one. Number two, this concept of the affinity of the vaccine being better than the natural immunity is somewhat incorrect as well. And here is why. Let's say here we have a cell in which the vaccine appears. This is the spike protein, RNA, right? So RNA is sent in. Let's say it's a Moderna vaccine. That RNA binds with the ribosome and they make this um, spike protein. This RNA is the same RNA that is making the spike protein as of the actual virus. There may be some difference in them, but they cannot afford to make a spike protein in a cell through the vaccine, which is very different from the virus itself. So when that spike protein is made and then it is shredded and then it is presented, now the vaccine system has no control over how the epitopes are presented and what epitopes are taken from this um, spike protein. Just like over here, the immune system, or we have no control that which parts of the virus are the epitopes. So the affinity in case of a vaccine is actually not greater than the affinity in case of the actual uh, infection. Actually, in case of the actual infection, affinity maturation becomes more and the infection teaches immune system more and more. In the case of vaccine, the second dose will do this. So after, let's say, 21 days, you introduce the vaccine once again, which created more spike proteins. These caused more of these presentations, plus some neutrophil picked those up, those cells that got killed in this process and spilled the spike proteins. Neutrophil picked them up, shredded them, threw them out in the uh, lymph nodes, or sorry, lymphatics, and they went into the lymph node where the B cell, memory B cells are sitting, and now some affinity maturation would occur. So a vaccine generally cannot have better affinity until this RNA is different and they cannot afford to make the RNA very different from the actual spike protein. Otherwise, epitopes will be different. I had this discussion yesterday. One possibility of better affinity is when we give antibodies from outside, monoclonal antibodies. Here, what we do is these are designer antibodies made outside of us. There, we can actually control the binding area and we can create sophistication here. We can control the constant region and we can create various bonds and protein modifications that this antibody lives with the, within us for a longer period of time. These can be better affined. And if that is the case, then yes, if you're talking about these, then they would have better affinity than our immune system. But if you're just talking about the vaccine generated immunity versus virus generated immunity, just from affinity point of view, then their affinity should be the same. So let's continue. There, there is one more thing, Ruby, is to kind of uh, strengthen your point. There is one more thing that is interesting with vaccines, which do not happen with the actual infection. That is the adjuvants. In the vaccine, we can put things like aluminum, which is not part of Moderna or Pfizer. We, we can put things like aluminum, which can go and cause the immune system to be bothered, to be irritated. And it responds with more force and more intensity, which causes it to kind of class switch faster and do faster affine transformations. There, it is creating a better precise mechanism. Unfortunately, with the Pfizer and Moderna, we don't have adjuvants. And the reason for that is they say we don't have adjuvants because we think that the lipid nanoparticle itself is a good adjuvant. So if we take it from adjuvant point of view, it is possible that vaccine might create an uh, immune system that is more um, intense. But still, compared to the affinity 
compared to the actual infection and the vaccine is going to be the same because affinity is not under the control of vaccine. It's under the control of the immune system. Doug, if ivermectin prophylaxis works and a person is exposed to the virus, will strong immunity develop? Yes. So, um, will, uh, I would, Doug, I would simply say, will immunity develop? Yes, because ivermectin does not interfere with the uh, infection. Rubies did that um, make sense? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Ruby says uh, monoclonal antibodies that are designed are being used, but CP is not working well and leading to enhanced genetic drift. Absolutely. So if you talk about monoclonal or polyclonal designer antibodies, then their affinity is better and they have their own drawbacks. You are absolutely correct. Um, <laughs> Jody has a very good question. So, <laughs> and Jody, I forgot to mention this. So I said that vaccines may cause the um, neurological symptoms. They may cause blood clotting. Now the question is, why do they cause blood thinning? And I forgot to mention it at that time. So thank you for reminding me. Let me explain it. Cool beans are the, <laughs> the, the most aware and informed group. OK, so check this out. This is basically idiopathic. I'll use this as a basis. Id idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Thrombocytopenic purpura. And this is, unfortunately, that doctor in uh, Florida um, who died of uh, the vaccine after the bleeding disorders. So here what is happening is, see, thrombocytopenic Thrombocyto, uh, thrombocyte production is less. So in our in our bone marrow, we have megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes, correct? They are big cells. That is why we call them megakaryocytes. They are big cells. These big cells are sitting in the bo bone marrows. Let me use a different color. Bone marrows, uh, trabeculae. The, imagine... Bone marrow is like a meshwork, three-dimensional meshwork. In that meshwork, you put some dough, you know, the dough, not the other dough, but the dough, which is, let, let's say, some flour and dough in there. And then you can pull pieces of the dough out of the mesh, and small pieces would come out, right? So out of this mesh, smaller pieces break off. And these small pieces are called platelets, platelets. Right? And they are called platelets because they look like tiny plates. These are responsible for blood clotting and, and um, coagulation. Or not responsible, they're part of that mechanism. Now, antibodies can actually hurt the megakaryocytes. They can also hurt when they lodge onto the platelets. They can destroy the platelets as well, which are part of the coagulation mechanism. So if antibody attacks this part of the tissue, then blood thinning would occur instead of blood thickening or clotting. So Jody, thank you very much for reminding it. I forgot. Uh, Gold Country Ra says, Monday I'll give everyone a contact to get cheap detesting. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Griff Bean says, sometimes idiopathic can be directed to some dogs. Idiopathic, yes. Um, some people have been directing it to me in last couple of days. Um, yes. So, Shard, they were idiopathic means of unknown origin. We don't, we don't know. Idiopathic, we do not know pathology. Um, OK, so so let me answer some more questions on this side as well. Julio, then Petra.
Question. Hi from Czech Republic. Just wanted to let you know that government approach approved ivermectin, but only for hospitalized patients. But at least that is good. People in Slovakia and Czech Republic are getting it on their own. Why are the numbers still not going down? And why are one of the worst in the EU? This is a very, very interesting question. And I actually looked up Czech Republic and I was actually surprised. So check this out. Um, 1.392 million um, cases. And this, this actually scared me. Look at this. So no reduction in cases. And actually, if you see here, active cases going up. This should not happen at this time anywhere. The, the masks, the social distancing, the ivermectin, some other mechanisms, meaning we should be actually aware enough that this doesn't happen. But this is happening. So yes, it is concerning. Um, I do not know exactly, Petra, why is this happening? I do not have scientific data to say how much ivermectin is being given and if that is doing anything. But if let's assume for a second from your statement that everybody is getting ivermectin and then we have this kind of an outcome, then that means I, ivermectin is not working. Look at this death data. I, I became scared when I looked at it. So what are the vitamin D levels? Uh, who is, is everybody taking ivermectin? What is the dose of ivermectin? What is the frequency of ivermectin? There are so many things to be seen, but this is scary. Linda says, this is worrying prospect. Would you comment, please? Um, let's see. We must halt all ongoing. OK, so we did talk about this a little bit. If, if needed, we can go over the whole uh, paper once more. Uh, this was Susan. Thank you very much. Uh, Robin O'Brien says, post COVID, why aren't doctors or no public health com campaigns warning people to take aspirin or anticoagulants after COVID to avoid stroke and heart attacks and thrombosis because of high risk, even in healthy people? Um, Robin, good question. And I think the reason is that the whole medical leadership is not busy figuring out what are the management protocols. They are just trying to figure out how do we get vaccines out. So I don't think they, they're even looking at these things. The approval of remdesivir or approval of uh, steroids or approval of bamlanivimab is not actually their function. They didn't do it. It's the companies who ran their trials or Oxford ran their trial and then went back and said, look, we can prove it is working. And then they used it. So I don't think that there is actually that thinking going on, at least for the US authorities. Other countries may be different. But you are correct that after COVID, especially moderate and severe, there should be follow up even during the uh, disease and follow up should be done in a way to protect the patient. Uh, Jenna says, Jean, Jean says, how long after recovering from COVID should you take aspirin or anticoagulant? Thank you a lot, Dr. Bean, for your excellent work. So this is actually during the, the recovery and continuing from there. So once again, if you do not have any other contraindications to take aspirins, these are blood thinners. These can be dangerous. There can be strokes as well with them. There can be issues. So please don't take them. This is not an advice. Talk with your doctor. But it does not need to be separated. It can continue. And then once, maybe a month or so later, you feel that your, your symptoms are fine, you do not have any issues, then you can stop them. So let's see here on the live side. Is everybody here or folks gone? How are things here? Texas Max says, Dr. B, no kidding. They're in fantasy land. Vitamin D levels, ivermectin. Absolutely. Vitamin D levels. Vitamin C, uh, K2, calcium, magnesium, quercetin, zinc. Then asking that, hey, guys, if you, there are risks. Let's say they don't, they're not convinced on ivermectin. Fine, then announce it this way. There can be risk with ivermectin. Take it on your own risk. We would like you to sign a waiver. But this is something that is interesting. Nobody is doing. There is no protocol formation. 
if you see the protocols are being formed by folks like Dr. Paul Merrick, he has a protocol. Others may have every hospital and doctors groups, they have some sort of protocol. But these this at this time should have come from these medical organizations because what else do they have to do at this time? Um, Edmond, Edmond her says, how long after the second dose Pfizer vaccine can someone get pregnant without having to wait for a study to see if it is safe or not? So the full protection is what, 10 days after the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And then it is also seen that the antibodies can actually be sent to baby through placenta, which is a good thing. Mothers send IgG to baby through placenta. And the first few months of their life, baby's immune system is not mature enough to combat the vaccines. So they use the IgGs given by mother. So it is actually a good thing if mother has those antibodies. Yes. Remember, there were at some point, there were like 210 or 20 vaccines. Um, Doug says, question, why is the fraction constant part of antibodies binding to non-immune cells tissues? Very, very good question. So let's see this one as well. The function of an antibody. So let's say this is an antibody. And there is heavy chain and then there are light chains. And this is the FC part of the heavy chain, the constant part of heavy chain. The constant part of heavy chain is also called the biological part. This is the part that's whose job is to do biological activities. This part's job, the variable part's job, is to bind with the antigen. So this thing, actually, it is its duty to bind with cells, not just with the immune cells, for example, macrophages or with the mast cells. It is duty, it has its duty to bind to many kind of cells and then start getting either engulfed or cleared out or do such things. So it is just performing, usually what it thinks is that it is binding to the pathogen. It is a bacteria it is sitting on or it is a virus. So it actually thinks it is doing a good job. But because our cells have this FC receptors, these this is the reason it gets stuck to them. And F FC receptors are present in many, many cells, which can then use the biological part and do certain actions. Macrophages do it, mast cells do it, and then some other cells as well. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Denise says, so uh, then why can't we inoculate a bovine and then drink that IgG-laden clostrum for protection? Yes. So in certain countries, they are there are actually cow milk or other milk preferred as well or given as well because there is, they say, power in there. But that is possibly IgG is coming from there too. Mother also, when she is lactating, also sends Ig. But she does not send IgGs in, in milk. She sends IgA in milk, which, which protects baby's muco mucosal membranes. OK, so um, <laughs> Texas says, Dr. Bean said first dose may be causal for pregnancy past bad joke. Yes, I remember saying it and then saying, oh, oh God, what did I just say? Yes. OK, so um, let me see here uh, in here. What else do we have? Mirror says, who do you think about? What do you think about sport and immune system? It's sad nobody talks about this. Mirror, um, I am going to apologize to you that at this time, I cannot also talk about the sports and immune system. But that is a good topic to take up at some point. Linda says, question, could you comment on the open letter? So I, Linda, I read this letter, but not as thoroughly to be able to answer it. 
So what I'll do is, as I do, I take this, I would highlight it, I'll understand it, and then I'll respond. Donna says, it would be great to hear your review of Novavax vaccine phase three trial. Yes, so that is actually very interesting. I was waiting for that as well. Um, so where is Novavax? Here. This is Novavax's release, Jan 28. And what is interesting for me here, and I would do a separate discussion as well, but here is what is interesting. They say that their efficacy is 89.3%. Well, let me see here. Read this. Efficacy by strain was calculated to be 95.6% against the original COVID-19 and 85.6% against the UK variant. So that's a very, very decent outcome. I have to kind of find their whole paper and read it and then present it to you. But I love this outcome. I was hoping Novavax would have some better outcome. What I did not see yet was the side effects. Um, I think when I read here, it said there were not much side effects, but I haven't gone through that data yet. So this was good. So Sandra says, what will be the first thing you do when things go back to normal, go on a trip? Absolutely. The first thing I'm going to do is what I am actually dying to do, and that is meeting the cool beans. Um, I used to tour worldwide every year and go to various colleges, various universities. Sometimes they would invite me. Sometimes I would just be in a country and they would say, hey, you are here. Why don't you come over and talk with us? And so I would. So these are all cool beans: medical students, nursing students, uh, doctors, early residents. So I used to go to them, and and we would sit down and we'll talk and we'll have fun. And this year, I thought we'll do that here in the U.S. as well. And uh, that is what I'm dying to do. Okay. So how about we stop? At this point, we answer a couple of more things and then stop. There is there is more. Uh, here on Twitter will continue, but it's about uh, more than one and a half hour. Say positive, good night. Dr. Mean, you're very objective. Let's continue. Thank you. Um, Denise says, Dr. Griffin, still you're on fire. <laughs> yes. All right, question. There is one. So Deborah Swank says, question on Czech Republic. They stated there is approval for hospital use, but not for out outpatient. So Deborah, the uh, cool bean who had left the comment, she said that people are able to get ivermectin on their own. So again, I do not know if it is over the counter and people can just go and get it and there is enough awareness or they are getting it like we in the US trying to find some doctor who can do it. So I have no idea exactly what's happening, but that's what she said. Colin, you are correct. I actually saw that video from her as well, and um, no response. Cool. So uh, there is one more question from Patricia. Uh, I work with people who, when sick from COVID, mostly manifest renally and with the liver, as opposed to lungs. One had heart and prior kidney issues, but was affected in liver and kidney, he passed. Wow, that's very sad. So uh, Patricia, I'm just, I do not know exactly their history and their body state, but kidneys have the most abundant ACE2 after those, then the GIT, then the cardiovascular system, then the respiratory system, and then the nervous system and other systems. So kidneys can actually become affected earlier. And then if somebody has, let's say, not the best of the health, then as soon as the uh, oxygenation system and cardiovascular system and the renal system goes up and down, the toxic outcome would cause liver issues as well. Mm -hmm. 
Building maker says, do you know if ivermectin has ever shown efficacy for asthma? Building maker, no. Honestly, not. This is a great question. I have never seen it this way. Cool. So I'm just seeing if there's any more question. Correct. So Shardivar says it's not over the counter in USA, but you can pay out of pocket if insurance does not pay with script. Correct. This is a very good question, Jilan. Is Italy using ivermectin? Because I was going to talk about Italy today as well and their second lockdown and what is going on in there. Um, it is a good question that are they using ivermectin? John Snyder, thank you very much for the super chat. <laughs> Island man says Luffy time you. Yes, cool. So we'll we'll plan one more Zoom call as well. Jim, this is a great idea. We can all go on a cruise together to Mexico and bring home my dress. <laughs> okay, fine. The first part is a great idea. <laughs> cool. All right. So Cool Beans, thank you very much for your time and for spending your time with me. Uh, I appreciate it. Tomorrow is my off. So I'll see you on Monday. Please, in the meantime, if you can like, subscribe, and share this, there are three links in the description. One is for the Patreon. The other one is to buy me coffees. And the third one is to support my work in general. So thank you very much. Stay safe and happy and healthy. I love you all, whoever, whatever you believe. Uh, I love you and I try to serve you. But at the same time, I do want to have my um, ground to express my opinion. And when I express my opinion and when I express my concepts, I have done my thorough studies to do them. If somebody does not like it, that I cannot go back and change my mechanisms, which are coming from researches and books. These are not mine. These are actually I learned from others. None of this all is mine. I wish I was capable enough and expert enough and brilliant enough to have done my own researches and contributed something valuable and unique. I am contributing what others have done, and I'm bringing them to you. So that is the best at this time I can do. And I want to be able to continue to do that without trying to modify my work to adjust to any one type of messaging. So with this, thank you very much. Have a good day, and I'll see you on Monday.